Hello everyone. In this lecture, I want to consider some of the connections the moon has with religion. Last time, we discussed the famous Earthrise picture taken by the crew of Apollo 8. The Apollo 8 mission has a connection to religion, but before we consider that, let's take a look at the trajectory flown by Apollo 8. This may help you better appreciate the Earthrise picture when you know the path of the Apollo 8 spacecraft. First step was to launch into Earth orbit. The second step was to orbit the Earth for some time to make sure everything was functioning as expected. The third step was to fire their engine and get away from the Earth. If you listen to NASA recordings, you may hear this step described using the phrase TLI, or translunar injection. When close to the moon, they fired their engine to get captured by the moon's gravity and go into orbit around the moon. They first went behind the moon and they captured the famous Earthrise picture as they were coming around. Step 5 was to conduct observations of the moon in lunar orbit. Next, they fired their engine to break away from the moon's gravity and headed back towards the Earth. The last step was to land back on Earth. The whole mission lasted for about six days, with 20 hours of that time being spent orbiting the moon. Know that AS-503 is the internal designation for the Apollo 8 mission. A is for the Apollo spacecraft, S is for the Saturn rocket, 5 is for the Saturn 5, and O3 is the third mission of the AS-500 series of launches. This is a letter written by Simon Bergen to Frank Borman. I'm not sure what Simon's role was in the mission, but Frank Borman was the mission's commander. The letter says, Dear Frank, I have given a lot of thought to what you might say. I think it would be a mistake for me to write a script or to anticipate in advance what you will see and feel. What you say has to be all Frank Borman. The telecast on Christmas Eve should basically contain what you see and what you feel about what you are seeing. And it should wind up with a quotation, about which more in a moment. Nothing about the transcendental significance of it or about Christmas Eve and peace on earth. As for what you will see and feel, I think these suggestions will help steer you into to what you want to say, but again, only if your instinct would take you into these areas anyway. Everybody knows what the moon looks like from the earth, but not how earth looks from the moon. Describe it briefly and compare it. 2. Compare your emotional reaction to orbiting the moon to your previous experience in orbiting the earth. What strikes you most about the moon? I remember you telling audiences on the Far East tour that if Mars was the red planet to astronomers, that the earth, which was bathed in beautiful blue, could be the blue planet to people in space. Is it also if the moon to earthbound people is a piece of cheese or a sliver of silver, what is the moon to an astronaut viewing it from orbit? 3. Viewing the moon's surface with the detachment of a scientist, just as you have so observed the earth from orbit, what do you see? 4. As you orbit the moon and observe the earth one quarter million miles away, does the fact that this faraway planet holds all the things that are dear to you have any special impact at the moment? 5. As you gaze at the distant planet Earth, you are aware that, at this very moment, each of its three and a half billion inhabitants who has any knowledge of your mission, regardless of wealth, race, tongue, culture, national loyalty, politics, or religious affiliation, is thinking of you and your two companions. 6. In fact, whenever before on Christmas Eve has so much of mankind focused on a single event, and perhaps with total unanimity, been prayerfully with three faraway men. After you have addressed yourself to these areas, and I would save some of it for the second telecast on the ninth orbit. About the only thing I can think of to match the majesty of the occasion and the evening is to read the opening lines of Genesis. These lines are Christian the world over in the very real sense of the word, and I think would sound the universal appeal and sense of reverence that is called for. You would be reading them while looking up at the earth from the moon. You could switch to them by saying something like, I would now like to read you the opening sentences of the Holy Scripture. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the water and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together onto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. I would close with 
episode. Good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. That ends the broadcast. Even though this is the Old Testament and Christmas Eve is identified with the New Testament, these words would, I think, be the most appropriate, most moving, and the most welcome for the occasion. But only if you yourself feel completely comfortable in saying them. I have the feeling that any direct message that you might compose reflecting on Christmas Eve, conditions on earth, and the way you feel about it at the moon could get awfully sticky. It would be difficult not to sound pretentious or patronizing. On the other hand, these simple words from the Bible spoken feelingly and simply by you could only be accepted as a sincere expression of one human being to his fellows and truly reflect the humility that the occasion must register. You could, by the way, take with you either a tiny edition of the Bible or simply the opening page torn loose. Do phone me when you get this and if it doesn't fit, I will try again. All the best, Frank. Yours, Simon Bergen. This is another letter written by Simon Bergen to Frank Borman. The date is not shown on the letter, but from the contents of the letter, it appears to me to have been written after the first letter. The letter says, Dear Frank, I'm glad you intend to go with the Genesis quote. I am sure it fits. But I have been doing some more thinking about this and would like to make these suggestions. 1. With six television transmissions, you are overexposed. There isn't that much to see, and with that much time, you could be tempted to pad, ham it up, or try to entertain. Avoid all of these. While you can't alter the number of telecasts, the one thing you can do is to keep them short. In other words, keep your audience hungry. Keep your comments short and simple, and cut off when you have no more to say. 2. The two most important telecasts are the one after arrival at the moon at 726 Eastern Standard Time, December 24, when you describe man's first close-up of the moon, and how the Earth Earth looks from the moon, and at 9.31 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Christmas Eve. I would devote the whole of the morning broadcast to a trained observer's description of what you see and what it feels like. No other comments on the one world thing, Christmas or anything else. It doesn't belong on a morning broadcast and would dilute the effect that night. But don't let this inhibit you from adding any color or subjective comment, such as one thing, it, the moon, doesn't look like is a piece of cheese. I would keep this telecast relatively short. It will add to the public's anticipation of your coming on that night. 3. The telecast on Christmas Eve should wind up with the Genesis quote, plus the closing line, good night, which you already have. However, I would work into your descriptive comment early in the show this line, as the first ambassadors of mankind to the environs of the moon, we just wish that the dream of peace and hope for mankind that was born tonight could be made real. Do not in any case try to sandwich it in after the Genesis quote, you can't top the Bible. You may want to work in another comment to this effect. Looking at the earth, which is about the size of a basketball from here, it's hard to believe it has always been torn by dissension and conflicts. I have thought better since of your using in full the comments I read to you on the phone Sunday, and which are contained in my second letter. They could sound forced and artificial. Also, the astronauts are respected for being non-political and having no axe to grind. While While your privileged position on Christmas Eve with the entire world, your captive audience, almost forbids preaching a viewpoint. What you say that is in your heart and comes out naturally is something else again. So whatever extracurricular comments you make, don't be preachy. Say it in your own way. Say what has universal appeal and cut out when you are through saying it. 4. With regard to the Genesis quotation, and this is important, read it slowly. It has to be read slowly over the air to be properly understood. You might try reading it a couple of times aloud on the ground for proper cadence. Say it naturally but slowly. 5. If you do talk about one world or peace, limit yourself to saying each once. More than that, for an astronaut addressing the world from the moon adds up to soapboxing. 6. I still think it would be a mistake to do the Christmas tree thing. It would be the counterpart of the placards and gags on the last mission and inevitably lead to unfunny or forced quips between ground ground control and spacecraft. It doesn't belong and you will find that you and your colleagues will be esteemed for sticking strictly to the business of the mission. The kids are going to be rooting for you anyway and will have plenty to entertain them back at home. 7. Never say words fail me or what we're looking at is beyond description. Just describe what you see or how you feel. 8. You may want to comment at the moon on two aspects of an astronaut's work. The difference in speed between orbiting the earth and the moon where along on this slow
slow bus if it's true that one travels much more swiftly in Earth orbit, and whether while circling the moon you are personally disappointed that you aren't going to be the first man to land there so near and yet so far away. 9. Except for Christmas Eve, don't be afraid to use a little humor. I know you won't. You might lead off with, a funny thing happened to us on the way to the moon, and then tell about something since the last telecast, like food floating out of reach, or one of you not quite getting dressed by the next telecast. Don't be afraid to say, the moon looks exactly as it did in our simulators, or if it is that way, that the first look was disappointing. 10. Avoid man on the moon comments. But listing all of these strictures is kind of silly. I'm sure your good sense and taste would take you through all of this entirely without outside advice. Best. Sai. This is a video of the live broadcast that Apollo 8 did from the moon on December 24th, 1968. At the time, this broadcast was estimated to have had the largest TV audience in history. A commemorative postage stamp in the United States is shown on the right. After the Apollo 8 mission, Madeleine Murray O'Hare sued NASA for reading from Genesis since she considered it to be a violation of the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. Madeleine used to live in Baltimore, Maryland, and she previously had sued the Baltimore public school system because she didn't think it was right that her son was asked to read the Bible in public school. Her case and a few others were combined into one Supreme Court case called Abington School District v. Trump. In 1963, the United States States Supreme Court ruled 8 to 1 that school-sponsored Bible reading in public schools is unconstitutional. However, her Apollo 8 case was rejected by the Supreme Court due to the lack of jurisdiction. Before we move on from Apollo 8, I just want to point out that if you are in Chicago, you can check out the Apollo 8 command module at the Museum of Science and Industry. At the time of Apollo 11 in July 1969, Madeline's case against NASA was ongoing, so NASA asked the crew to be, quote, general in their comments. Buzz Aldrin, the lunar module pilot, stated the following over the radio. This is the LM pilot. I'd like to take this opportunity to ask every person listening in, whoever and wherever they may be, to pause for a moment and contemplate the events of the past few hours and to give thanks in his or her own way. He then took communion off air. Buzz Aldrin at the time attended Webster Presbyterian Church, just outside of Houston, Texas. The church still celebrates Lunar Communion Sunday in July to commemorate 
with the Apollo 11 mission. Now I would like to switch to looking at the moon's connection to some of the religions in the world. The story of creation is discussed in the first chapter of Genesis in the Bible. Verses 14 through 16 states, And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times, and days and years, and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the star. The moon isn't named, but it's implied that the lesser light is the moon. Yeah, on the right is a painting by Michelangelo from the 1500s depicting this creation story. In the painting, God is shown on the right with his left hand on the moon. Easter is a Christian holiday celebrating the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Since the process of determining the date of Easter each year is dependent on the specific denomination or church, I have listed it here somewhat generally as the Sunday following a full moon in spring. One of the dates in the upcoming year is April 12, 2020. I've included two works of art depicting the resurrection of Jesus. In Islam, one of the stories in the Quran is Muhammad splitting the moon. On the right is a painting from the 16th century that shows this event. I have also included two English translations of the part in the Quran that mentions the splitting of the moon. One translation states, the hour has drawn near, the moon has split. The other translation states, the hour of judgment is nigh, and the moon is cleft asunder. Ramadan is a month of fasting, prayer, and reflection in Islam. It's on the ninth month of the Islamic calendar and goes from one crescent moon to the next. We'll discuss lunar calendars in a moment. The upcoming Ramadan is from April 23rd to May 23rd, 2020. Diwali, the festival of lights, is celebrated by a number of religions in the early fall coinciding with the new moon. The next Diwali is October 27th, 2019. Shown are two images of Diwali celebrations. Vesak is the celebration of the birth, enlightenment, and death of Gautama Buddha. It's typically celebrated on the first full moon in May. The next Vesak is on May 7, 2020. On the left is Vesak in Indonesia and on the right in Sri Lanka. Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year and is celebrated 163 days after the first day of Passover on a new moon. The next Rosh Hashanah takes place from September 29th to October 1st, 2019. Shown on the left are traditional food consumed on Rosh Hashanah, and on the right is a painting depicting people praying by flowing water. Mid-Autumn Festival is celebrated on the full moon of the 15th day of the 8th month. The next Mid-Autumn Festival takes place on September 13th, 2019. Shown on the left is a Mid-Autumn Festival celebration in Singapore. In the middle is a painting of Chang'e, whose story we discussed two lectures ago. Also, one of the traditional food consumed during this holiday is mooncake, as shown on the right. At this time, I'd like for you to take a few minutes to explore the moon's connection with religion on your own. Is there something that you can find that is particularly interesting to you? Now, I would like to switch topics a bit to discuss one reason the moon is very prominent in religion. As we have already seen, a number of religious holidays are determined by phases of the moon. Before we go further, I would like for you to put these moon phases in order starting from the new moon. I'll give you a hint that the new moon is C. So please start with C and try to figure out which phases would come after that during a month. Here are the phases of the moon in the correct order. Did you get the phases in this order? Okay, now since we have the phases of the moon in the correct order, can you name all of the phases of the moon? Here are the names of the phases of the moon. You don't necessarily have to memorize these names, but it's convenient to have when describing the phases. Now let's take a closer look at the lunar calendar. Here I'm showing a drawing of the Earth's orbit around the Sun, as well as the Moon's orbit around the Earth. Please note that this drawing isn't to scale, but it will get the main point across. Let's consider what is the period of the moon. That is to say, what is the time required for the moon to go around the earth once? If you look up the moon's orbit, you will notice that two periods are listed. One is called the sidereal period of the moon, which is a little over 27 days. The other is called the synodic period of the moon, which is about 29 and a half days. This diagram illustrates the difference between the two periods of the moon. Let's consider the sidereal period first. The sidereal period of the moon is the time that it takes to go all the way around and come back to the same location of its orbit. In the diagram, the moon starts off directly to the right of the Earth. So it takes a little over 27 days for the moon to orbit the Earth and come back to the same spot. Notice though that in 27 days, the Earth would have moved forward in its orbit around the Sun. In the beginning, the moon would have started with a full moon phase. Would it be a full moon in the second location after about 27 days? The answer is no, since as you can see, the moon isn't a 
aligned with the sun as it was in the beginning, it takes about two more days to get to that location, in which case it will again have a full moon phase. As such, this is the reason why the synodic period is a little longer than the sidereal period. Since we directly observe the phases of the moon, typically the 29.5 day period is what people talk about and also use for lunar calendars.